Thanks very much for the organizers uh, of this important symposium. I think that uh, we all have to work harder to get people together across the traditional disciplinary boundaries if we're going to understand what's happening on Earth today. And so as uh, Sarah has introduced the idea of what makes an Earth habitable, and I'm really going to discuss what makes it uninhabitable. <laughs> and so uh, let me just uh, start by saying, um, oh yeah, trial bites, uh, is that's what I'm going to be talking about in part. All right, so let me start with, a, with an overview of, uh, of Earth's oxygen in its atmosphere um, from uh, four billion years ago to the present. This is from a review paper uh, from 2014. And, uh, and of course, for the first two and a half billion years, uh, Earth had very little oxygen, and then there was a rise, and then, uh, and then about 700 million years ago, there was another rise to approximately our, our current number. And, and the point I really want to make with this, with this image is to uh, reiterate what, what Marsha McNutt said, which is that uh, no matter what happens to our atmosphere and our climate, the, the Earth is, is going to be fine. It's, it's humans who are in trouble. Because with each of these atmospheric changes, there have been creatures that have benefited and creatures that have been driven extinct. Uh, and we tend to think of the rise of oxygen as a good thing, right? This is photosynthesis, and these are the things that make our life exciting in the world that we know. Um, but of course, there were a lot of creatures that found that oxygen was a tremendous poison and were driven into little tiny refugia uh, through our Earth. And so, and so recall that these big swings are, are good for some and bad for others. And that's really, I think, the lesson. We have the challenge as Earth and planetary scientists that doing double-blind replicable uh, uh, experiments is very difficult. We've got one Earth, and we're looking at it at one point in time. And so uh, what I want to spend the rest of the talk here telling you about is the results of, of a study that we've been working on for uh, six or seven years, I guess, um, about the end Permian extinction and the Siberian flood basalts. And so, and so as David uh, referred to, to understand things in the past further back than the ice cores, we have to go to the rock record. And uh, so I'm going to tell you a story of interrogating the rock record to understand a period of time that um, uh, Jeff Keel at the National Centers for Atmospheric Research said was the time most similar to the present day in Earth history. And it was exceptionally catastrophic and therefore very, very interesting, I think. So let's talk about, uh, let's talk about the end Permian extinction 252 million years ago. So this extinction is recorded in ocean sediments. And, uh, and so we tend to think of it as an extinction of, of oceanic microorganisms. And so it's good to remember that there were some uh, more charismatic, gigantic creatures. Imagine a crinoid 40 meters long. Uh, end of the crinoids. It was the end of a lot of the lystrosaurs. Uh, and, uh, and it was the end of the Eurypterids. Can you imagine a two and a half meter Eurypterid? Someone once said to me, that takes a lot of butter and lemon. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and, uh, and so what are the ways that we know that a global extinction can occur? This extinction was something above 90% of species in the oceans died and something above 70% of species on land died. This was a really catastrophic event. It was the end of many things and then the beginning of many more things. Uh, well, we know it wasn't nuclear war, and the other, the other common uh, 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 cause of extinctions in the rock record would be meteoroid impact. And as much as many, many scientists have searched the world around for evidence of meteoroid impact at this moment, that really appears not to have been the cause. And so, and so we're left with the thought that it could have been volcanism. Um, this is uh, a Google Maps image of, of Asia from, Siberia, uh, from Scandinavia on the top left to the Kamchatka Peninsula on the right. And in, uh, you can just see the tip of Lake Baikal in the center bottom of the screen and the Tymir Peninsula at the top where, where I've been uh, um, fortunate to have some adventures. Let me see if I can find this button. No. Where's the button on this? Oh, there we got it. I got it. Thank you. So Tymir Peninsula. So this purple region is, uh, is where the Siberian flood basalts, this giant volcanic event that happened at that time, is bedrock. So if you can burrow through the sphagnum moss, you, the first thing you encounter is the Siberian flood basalts. And the white region is where you have to actually dig through younger rocks to get to the Siberian flood basalts, but they're shown in drill cores. So this was a huge event, a huge event. And you might right away say, well, of course, then, it was the volcanoes. How could this not cause a global extinction? But the 
the thing is that most of the lavas that have been studied from this event are calm, effusive lavas like Hawaii. In Hawaii, you can walk up to the lava, you can stand right by and admire it, you can go home, you haven't died, the Hawaiian Islands are you know, well populated. And so the thought was that these kinds of plateau lavas that occur in Siberia do not carry significant volatile loads. They could not have changed the climate. And so we went out to try to test that. And just to give you a sense of the volume, I've taken the, um, the effusive, uh, the extrusive volumes of a lot of different volcanic events and shown them here, starting with the tiny little Mount St. Helens that for many of us was a huge event. It's a tiny event, tiny event. Iceland in 1783, the Lockheed eruptions, which uh, caused tens of thousands of people to die from starvation. Uh, both from uh, cooling from sulfur in the northern hemisphere over a number of seasons and also from direct vegetation kill by uh, hydrofluoric acid. Uh, and so uh, I, I hope that many of you know about hydrofluoric acid. At least at the time, uh, at one, one of the times that I was at MIT, that was the only chemical that had its very own safety course. And, uh, and this was naturally occurring, and I'm going to come back to hydrofluoric acid. And then up through the, uh, the big uh, Yellowstone eruptions that uh, many people are, are fond of making us afraid of the next one coming along. And so here's how that compares to the Siberian flood basalts. And so again, right away, you'd say, well, of course the volcanoes caused the extinctions. But you have to show that they carried climate changing chemicals. And you have to show that they can eject them into the atmosphere. And this was not a foregone conclusion. And so uh, we took uh, five or six, I can't remember now, expeditions to Siberia to get samples of the rocks that we could interrogate. Um, Sam Bowring and Brad Hager and myself on the right, and Ben Black, who was our graduate student, who's now a postdoc at Berkeley, and then uh, two of our Russians, Russian friends, Anya and Roma Veselovsky from the um, Moscow State University, and then John Rubin um, and, uh, uh, I've just blanked out on his name, great guy, filmmakers. Um, and that's uh, taken way up north in Siberia. So here we are on, on, the, on the Kutoi River collecting samples. And here we are collecting samples at the base of the lavas. You just have to put in a few of these pictures when you're talking about this. Looking back down at the Kutoi River from where we were taking samples. And then, uh, so here's, here's the punchline. I'm going to tell you right now, so you're kind of prepared for the data in a moment. Where did these rocks, where did these magmas get these climate changing uh, chemicals, they got them from the bedrock that they were chambered in. So it turns out that these magmas came up from the mantle with very little, and then they were chambered inside of a 12 kilometer deep basin that first contained what are called evaporites, the results of drying out an inland ocean. So you get limestone, you get gypsum, you get everything that's in seawater, only in rock form, topped with one of the biggest coal, uh, um, coal basins in the world. And that's where these uh, magmas were chambered. And you know what else was in that evaporite basin, even at this time, was hydrocarbons. And so this is, uh, you know, Mother Nature burning hydrocarbons uh, to change the climate only 252 million years ago. And so, uh, and so here's some uh, low-grade coal on the, on the right and some lava on the left. And then uh, this is a cliff of gypsum, which is very uh, enriched in sulfur, and sulfur becomes a big part of this story. Here's another picture of that cliff. This is Seth Burgess, who did the geochronology on this project with limestone uh, up to just over his head, and above that, about 100 meters of gypsum. This is an exceptional basin to go through, it really is. And so um, the other part of the story is, it turns out these were not all calm, effusive lavas like Hawaii normally is. Um, there have been sort of rumors of explosive volcanism, like Toba, like Pinatubo, like Mount St. Helens. Um, but it had never been really explored by geologists or published about. And in fact, in, in 2015, we published the first major survey of these rocks in, in the English language. Um, here's a cliff that is 100% produced by explosive eruptions. Um, there's, there's a huge amount of explosive rock that underlies the lavas that came first. Here's Ben Black next to some of these uh, explosive uh, results with uh, some, some specular sandstone that's been driven up from well underground. And here's the same thing with a bit of coal, a big lump of coal that was drawn up from underground. And uh, this is a little unpublished result I wanted to share with you today. Um, some years ago, some scientists from the Canadian Geological Society found in some of the Arctic islands of Canada bits of burnt coal that look like this, uh, coal fly ash. And they posited, they were at the right age to be the end Permian, and they posited these came from 
coal burning from the Siberian flood basalts that were carried around by polar um, wind currents and deposited in Canada. And so we spent an awful lot of time looking for places that the magmas really interacted with these coals. And in the north, we found there was really almost no evidence for interaction. Um, the coals are right at the surface. The lava is just coming out on top. And there isn't a lot of uh, you know hanging around with the coal. But in the south, uh, which is where most of these explosive uh, rocks um, are. We brought samples of that home, and we sent them up to these guys in the Geological Survey in Canada, and they found um, many, many examples of identical coal ash. So it seems like burning coal was part of the explosive volcanism in the south. And um, of the very, very large amount of rocks that were produced there, uh, some of them are reworked, and some of them were for calmer eruptions, just where magmas went into lakes. But the ones where we have evidence for hot explosive volcanism total something like 10,000 cubic kilometers, which is 10 times bigger than a Yellowstone eruption. So this was a huge event with huge climate changing um, possibilities. And so this is the way our our uh, project laid out. We did the geochronology. This was done by Sam Bowering and uh, Seth Burgess. This was his PhD thesis. And they have um, absolutely proven with the world's highest precision that about 70 to 80% of the volcanic rocks were erupted. And then the extinction happened. And then the volcanism continued. And so, and so we now know uh, without a doubt that uh, temporally the extinction is in the right place to be caused by the rocks, now proving that the volcanoes caused the eruption is a more complicated process. And so I'll just show you quickly some volatile measurements we've taken by interrogating those rocks and what happens when you put them into climate models. And so on the vertical axis here is sulfur. And the data is from all over the Siberian flood basalt. So this is Ben Black's work, part of his thesis. And those three horizontal lines, the top one is the largest amount of sulfur found in the Columbia River flood basalts. The middle one is from Laki that caused death. Uh, by famine because of uh, crop failure. And the bottom one is from the Deccan Traps, is another similar kind of flood basalt. So a lot of sulfur. And we'll talk about acid rain from sulfur in a moment. A lot of chlorine, up to a weight percent of chlorine, the same horizontal lines at the bottom. So this is coming straight from that evaporite basin being in, in, uh, incorporated into the magmas and erupted. And fluorine, my favorite, as much as two weight percent of fluorine in these rocks. Uh, and so what happens when you take, um, what happens when you take chlorine and fluorine and carbon and you put it into a hot eruptive plume? Well, this was first posited by Sveta Planka and Henrik Svensson at the University of Oslo. You get halocarbons. You get naturally occurring chlorofluorocarbons, which is something that never occurred to me could happen. And, uh, and yet it did happen. They've demonstrated that through lab experiments and by baking uh, the sedimentary rocks. And we've shown here that it was actually erupted out of the volcanoes as well. So two pieces of, um, of modeling to show you. So this is with the National Center for Atmospheric Research's um, 252 million year old uh, or model of that time. So there's the time of Pangaea. So you're seeing a map of the world here with the outlines of Pangaea and the ocean in the middle. And so um, you can't really model the whole event, which is over a million years. And so this is from one sill emplacement, one lava flow, or one of the explosive eruptions only. Um, and it brings the pH of rain in the northern hemisphere down below 3, where 5 is the pre-industrial average. And so all through the northern hemisphere oceans, and you can see exactly where um, the flood basalts uh, were right there, still 60 degrees north, the same as today. And these stars, by the way, are where examples of um, mutated pollen grains have been found uh, at that time, which is thought to be caused by ozone loss, which is the next slide. But if you get down below a pH of 3, you're killing amphibians and fish, and you're, and you're really damaging plants. And so this is, this is highly um, uh, 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 coincident with the idea of, a, of, an, of an extinction being caused. But it's hard to prove that last mile. And so this is ozone. Uh, and so this is from the uh, CH3Cl re released in the lower troposphere, again, from just one eruptive event, not the whole flood basalts. And you see it takes the entire world down below 140 Dobson units. Now, the, that's about the lowest uh, ozone measured in the southern hemisphere ozone hole in the present era. So it takes the whole Earth down well below that for as long as 10 years at a time from each one of these eruptions. So um, it's very tempting to say, this is it. 
this kind of global climate change, which we have demonstrated these flood basalts could cause, is what caused the end Permian extinction, this huge extinction of multicellular life everywhere. Uh, maybe the worst thing since the rise of oxygen for, for, for creatures that were happy on Earth. But just as you saw with the earlier talks, and we'll hear later today, connecting that last kilometer is really complicated. Proving that this is actually what caused things to die is incredibly difficult, particularly back in the rock record where we have relatively little information about land creatures. Um, so we've taken this about as far as we know how to right now. I think we've taken it big strides past where it's been before. Um, and, uh, and I would posit that the kind of catastrophe um, that happened at that time is, uh, in fact, very similar to the kind of catastrophe we're creating today. And, and the lesson is um, life is going to be fine, but, but I think that we've got some work to do to maintain our quality of life. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, Linda. Questions for Lindy. Fascinating detective story about old extinctions, but please. Uh, what, can we say anything about the volume of the, of the gases versus if we sort of burn all the coal and oil and natural gas, for example? Yeah, that, that uh, the question is, haha. <laughs> the question is, can we quantify the gas release from the Siberian flood basalts and compare it to what humankind is doing today? And, and yes, we can do that. You know, we've made estimates of what each individual lava flow might have produced. I don't have those numbers, unfortunately, to recite to you. But the big question is, um, it, it, small perturbations, a single lava flow, bad news, right? 10 years of ozone loss. What's the effect on the creatures, those that have quick reproduction or slow reproduction or live under the water, over the water? And then when you try to integrate over the whole uh, flood basalt province, it's not a good comparison today because today we are uh, continually pumping out high levels of these gases. And for the flood basalts, it was, it was a pulsed event, um, which should have actually less effect than a continuous event like the one that we're causing today. Rob? Uh, so you, any speculation of what would cause this incredibly uh, anomalous volcanic event? Any speculation about what would cause the volcanic event? Yeah, since I, I started studying this problem as a graduate student in EAPS um, with uh, Tim Grove and Brad Hager looking at it from a geodynamic point of view. And, and, and these great big periodic flood basalts are the, the best thing that we posit is that they, they come from hot plumes uh, inside the mantle. And now there's increasing geophysical evidence being able to actually image these hot plumes coming up underneath Iceland, for example. Um, it's a, in, in a fluid dynamic sense, it's easy to imagine. You've got a bottom boundary la layer against the core um, where heat is being conducted outward, and that bottom boundary layer is perturbed and, and uh, in a fluid dynamical sense goes unstable, and it, and it rises uh, through the otherwise slightly cooler mantle as a thermal anomaly, and then it melts when it gets close to the surface. And the thing that we've really added to that story is that uh, is that, that likely destabilizes the bottom of the plate um, and causes it to drip off, which both uh, increases the rate of, of melting and causes it to burst. So you get, uh, I mean, burst in terms of, of high output lavas, and also helps to shut it off, because these flood basalt uh, events all seem to take about a million years from start to finish. And exactly why they start and exactly why they finish remains a bit of a mystery. So we've been trying to add to that through these kinds of geodynamical models. One more question. Um, what's the overall effect on temperature of these events? It seems like the dust would actually cool things, but then the gases would have a warming effect at the same time. Right. What's the, what's the overall temperature effect is the question. Uh, and so um, I believe it was um, Wignall who recently published um, some results on the, on the temperature rise 
uh, at the end Permian. We don't have great proxies for temperature back then. And so although we can pull temperature out of these NCAR models, we don't feel very confident about them because indeed the sulfur creates aerosols which produces cooling and the ash produces cooling. There's so much interesting work to be done on this ash, which we have a lot of samples of. And then presumably the CO2 and also of course the uh, chlorofluorocarbons are tremendous greenhouse gases, super effective. And so it's a, it's a, um, it's a, it's a, a competition. And also, um, through time, it appears that the Siberian flood basalts were emitting different kinds of gases. And so that's going to also cause that competition to change over the time of the eruption. Um, stay tuned. We're doing more work on that. And, and an interesting thing is, I, I didn't talk very much about carbon here. I mentioned the coal, the hydrocarbons. Um, uh, but an interesting thing we've found is that, is that in the little melt inclusions, the tiny droplets of trapped magma inside crystals that we use to get these measurements, very many of them are super saturated in carbon, such that we're confused about how that could happen. <laughs> and so we, we haven't published on the carbon story yet, but the carbon story could be gigantic. Thank you, Lindy. Thanks very much. It brings us right back in time. Thank you very much.